All right, so um, we'll be getting off with upper limb organization and development. Um, so we're going to be considering the sequential proximal distal segmentation of the upper limb. So just beginning off, so you guys already know what the shoulder is, right? You guys already know the arm. You guys know the forearm. Wait, you said you can't see? And of course you guys already know where the hands are. And let me maybe show this on a better picture here. So here goes the shoulder, right? Here goes the arm. Here goes the forearm. And here goes the hand. Now this is the thing. So a lot of times when you say arm, some people might be thinking, oh, like, you know, this, this whole thing is my arm. But I guess uh, speaking from like an anatomical perspective, so technically this right here is your arm, right? So not this whole thing is your arm. So this is your arm, and then this is your forearm. And then you guys already know what the hands are, and then you guys already know what the shoulder is. All right, so now specifically, when you're looking at the hands, so human beings have well-developed hands, all right? And it allows for a lot of um, intricate motions um, or movements. So one of the motions that was covered and touched upon by Dr. Diego is opposition, all right? So the easiest way to think about opposition is where you take like your, um, your thumb and you basically try to touch one of your fingers like, like that. So this is like opposition. And this is, this is an example of it. So when you take your thumb, the motion of taking your thumb and then touching one of your fingers, that is like opposition. So the ability to do that is opposition. Right. So also, we have developed like the ability to grip something, so like power grip. So this is like when you're literally grabbing something in a very like firm, like forceful way. Here goes some, just some depictions of that. So right here. So I think this person is grabbing, it's just like, I think it's probably a stick or something, right? So it's like the forceful grip. So in the lectures it was mentioned that, so like the gorillas and stuff, they have the ability to forcefully, you know, they have this power grip, right? They can forcefully like grab things and stuff like that. Um, but when you when you come to the level of precision precision grip, so this is like fine, like um, I guess when you finally hold something, uh, such as like when you hold a pencil <coughs> and write. So this is more so associated with humans, right? The precision grip, whereas for the power grip. You can see that in humans or like in, um, you know, apes, stuff like that. And just to show you an example of precision grip, so here you have someone holding a pencil, here they're holding like a little ball, marble or something, All right? All right, so we got the shoulder, the arm, the forearm, right? So we're making a distinction that anatomically, when you talk about the arm, you're just referring to the length of like the humerus. Right, and when you're talking about the forearm, you're talking about like the, the radius and the ulna area, right? And then you guys already know what the hand is, but then specifically, when you're talking about the hands, there are different uh, motions or um, movements that we that uh, we have developed, I guess, as humans. Uh, so that's opposition, power grip, and precision grip. The power grip we can see like in the monkeys. And the precision grip is more so specific to humans, right? All right, so I just showed you guys the segmentation, all right? And again, we're focusing on what the upper limb, right? Okay, so now what we're going to get into is the, the joints, so the important joints, all right? Okay, so the first joint that we're going to consider is your sternoclavicular joint. So, okay, so the first thing here is sterno. So this is coming from your sternum, right? So that's like here. And then your uh, clavicular is like clavicle, right? 
So it's the joint that is connecting your your sternum with your clavicle. Right? So the components, of course, would be the sternum, the sternum and the clavicle. <coughs> See if I can give you guys an example here. Okay, so here, so right here, all of this right here is your sternum, right? So your sternum actually has three parts. So it has the manubrium, it has the body, and it has the xiphoid process. So it looks something like. So it would look something like. Uh, <laughs> so like this whole thing here would be like your sternum, right? And again, like the sternum is like this whole thing right here, like the bone right here, and so it has three components. So you have your manubrium, right? You got the body, and you have the xiphoid process, right? So the clavicle is coming, it's joining with the sternum at this point right here. And this is what we're calling the sternoclavicular joint. This is your sterno joint right here, right? So that's what we're seeing right here, right? This is your sternoclavicular joint. Okay, so the next joint that we'll, we're gonna consider is your acromioclavicular joint, right? So we have the clavicle again, so we saw the clavicle up here, right? But in this case, we have the clavicle joining to your acromion. So the acromion is actually a projection off of your scapula, right? So the acromion is a projection that is coming off of your scapula. So in this case here, so here we have, this is the scapula, right? Okay, so what was this called? Okay, that was the clavicle. Okay, so um, it's a little bit hard to see here, but behind, so like right here, this is your acromion. Let me see if I have a better image of this. Okay, here it is. So once again, this is your clavicle, right? This here would be your scapula, right? Mm -hmm. Now, coming off of your scapula, you have this right here. This is your acromion, right? Now, you, you shouldn't confuse the acromion with your um, coracoid process, all right? So this right here is your coracoid process, all right? So... But our concern here is this joint right here. So that's your acromion, acromioclavicular joint, right? So the acromio, then your clavicular joint, right? So the first joint we just saw was what? Sternoclavicular, right? Joining the clavicle to your sternum. And then we said the sternum had three parts. What were the three parts? And, okay, so I heard xiphoid process, I heard body. Manubrium. And the manubrium. Okay, cool. And then we had the acromioclavicular joint, all right? So now the next joint we're considering is the glenohumeral joint, all right? And this is your, this is your shoulder joint, all right? So the components of it is uh, your scapula and your humerus. Okay, so in this case here, here, once again, we see the scapula, right? And this would be your humerus, right? The distal part of the humerus has like a, um, is like a half of a sphere, so it can fit into this uh, glenoid fossa here. Uh, and so then we get the, the shoulder joint right here, right? So this would be like your shoulder joint right here. Cool. So sternoclavicular joint, acromioclavicular joint, the glenohumeral joint, right? And now we're considering the elbow joint, right? You guys already know what the elbow joint is. Uh, this will probably be a review for a lot of you guys. But so you got the radius and the ulna, right? So the radius is the one outer, like on the outer part here, right? And then the ulna is the one, right, more medial. And that's going to be joined with the distal part of your humerus, right? Let me 
see if I have this one on here. Okay, so here, right? So we would have what? We would have the radius and the ulna, right? And it's, they're joining with what? Your humerus. So that's the elbow joint. So what joint was this right here? The what? Not gluco. Glenno. 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 Glenno humeral joint, or you can just call it a shoulder joint, right? Okay, so what joint was this? Chromio Okay, that's right, chromio clavicular joint. And which one was here? So sterno clavicular, sterno clavicular joint. All right. Okay, cool. All right. All right. So sterno clavicular joint, right? Chromio clavicular joint. Glenohumeral joint, which is also the shoulder joint, right? The elbow joint, um, then we have the, the wrist joint or the radiocarpal joint. Okay, so the major thing is that we have the carpal bones and they are interac interacting directly with your radius. So it turns out that the ulna does not directly interact with these carpal bones. Um, but let me actually show this so that what I'm saying actually makes sense. Okay, so so we already established that this is what? The radius. That's the radius. That's the radius. And then what is this? Okay. So distal to these guys, we're going to have our carpal bone. Okay, so these are the carpal bones. Right. So it turns out that the radius is the one that is directly interacting with these carpal bones. Uh, the ulna is not directly interacting with these guys. So that's why it's called the um, radiocarpal joint, right? Because the, the radius is more so like the one directly interacting with them, right? So this is also called the wrist joint, right? And then you have a joint connecting the carpals, right, with your metacarpals. So these guys right here, these are your metacarpals, and then these are your phalanges, right? So, but there's a joint right here, like right here, connecting your carpals with your metacarpals. So that joint is called your carpal metacarpal joint, right? And then the component, right? You got the metacarpal bones, right? And then the carpal bone, right? That should make sense. Uh, then maybe um, it's good to maybe know that there's eight carpal bones. I don't think Dr. Diego went into too much detail with this. Uh, he probably just like showed, you know, I think he showed like a little image with the different locations of the joints. I think that's what he did, right? But I think it's just maybe worth pointing out, right? Okay, so the major thing that we are going to be talking about is the embryo. But maybe before we talk about that, we'll just kind of consider the cross-sectional analysis of the arm and the forearm. So you guys remember what we said about the arm, right? So where is the arm? Humerus. So it's just the humerus, right? Whereas the forearm will be this, right? Okay, so we're just going to consider a cross section of the arm, right? And then a cross section of the forearm. And we're just going to kind of consider some things because we're going to be considering like the embryological, um, I guess, what form those structures embryologically. So the major contents that we're going to be seeing is like the skin, superficial fascia, which is like fat and stuff. Uh, nerves, arteries, bones, right, and muscle. Okay, so this is a cross section, right? And this would be a cross section through your arm, right? So this part, cross section through your arm. And just kind of getting oriented here, so, so this would be anterior, right? And this would be posterior, right? And this would be medial, and this would be lateral. Right. So here you have your humerus, right? Which is of course just the bone, long bone right here. Um, and so here we have th these would be like muscles. These would be compartments of muscles. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, so we wouldn't. Well, in this case, in this case right here, we wouldn't be considering like um, the ra radio and all the. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you got. You got it. Okay. So you got it. Okay. So someone want to answer this question? Who wants to answer this question? Um. So. So we're looking in anatomical position. Yeah. With your arms facing this way, so this is your anterior, which is the front of your body, and posterior would be towards the back of your body. Yeah. So if you're like this, right? So then if you're if you're considered medial, so this would be medial, right? So then over here would be my ulna, right? And then over here would be my my radius, right? But we're we're specifically considering right cross section of the arm and and not the forearm, but we we won't see the forearm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So so these would be like uh, compartments of like muscle and stuff, like muscle. So here, this would be like muscle. Oh, this would be muscle. Actually, no, wait. This is nerves, nerve and arteries. So this is nerve and arteries. But I would suppose maybe a muscle would be there. But okay, so. So this would be like muscle, muscle. And here you have like maybe a nerve running through there, uh, a vein running through there. So then above this, we would have the superficial fascia. So this is like the, the whole adipose tissue and stuff, right? And then that's going to be covered over with the skin. So as we go like along with this like with this lecture, um, so we're going to be seeing what structures embryologically led to these different structures. So like the muscle, uh, the bone, the superficial fascia, the skin. Right. So we're going to be looking at the structures that led to the formation of these guys. All right, so looking at the forearm, right? So this would be medial, right? And this would be lateral. This would be anterior, this would be posterior. All right, so this would be the ulna, right? This would be your radius. So here you would have muscles, muscles. And this is, would also be muscles here. All right, let me erase some of this stuff. What is the IM exactly? I think this is interosseous membrane. Uh, interosseous membrane. Yeah. Have you guys encountered interosseous membrane? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, so it's like uh, like it's like connective, like thick, dense connective tissue that is connecting the radius and the ulna. Okay, so I guess I didn't point this out, but you have like intermuscular septum or septa. This would be intermuscular septa right here. And uh, let's see what else. Okay, yeah, you have superficial fascia. And then you'll just have the overlying skin, right? So another thing that's important to point out here is that when you're looking at the muscle, right, uh, you want to consider the, the flexors and the extensors, all right? So the, the muscles that are gonna be more anterior, those are gonna be your flexors, right? So, so if, if you're looking at my hand right here, so the muscles that are anterior, right, these are gonna be my flexors. So for example, I could use my, you know, the biceps and I can flex, right? Right, or I could use the triceps and I can extend, right, my hand. Um, so yeah, you would have the flexors on the top or anterior and then you would have the extensors on the back, the back of your hand, right? So these would be your flexors let me erase some of this. So the muscles that are more anterior will be your flexors, right? And the ones that are more posterior are going to be your extensors, right? And it's the same thing for the forearm, right? So the muscles that are more anterior are going to be your flexors, and the ones that are more posterior are going to be your extensors. So Moses, yeah. Question. If your radius is in that, and the bone is right there, shouldn't the posterior be anterior? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so now we're getting into the embryo. So this is just like, uh, just maybe introduction. Okay, so 
I think you guys are really confused with this. I was very confused with this when I was um, um, during the first year, but a lot of it kind of like cleared up with time. But I guess we can begin with the appearance of the limb bud. So around day day 24, right, you're going to have your the upper limb bud is going to start to appear. And then around day 28, you're going to have the lower limb bud appearing. So let's maybe add some pictures to this. So here, around day 24, right, we see what? The upper limb buds, right? So maybe somewhere around day 28, right, right here, we have the lower limb buds coming out. Okay, so um, how are these limb buds being formed? How are they being formed? Okay, so before we can even consider how these limb buds are being formed and stuff like that, we got to go back in time, right? We need to ensure, right? We need to ensure that we have the three uh, germinal layers, right? Three germinal layers. So we need to ensure that we have the ectoderm, right? We need to ensure that we have the mesoderm, and we need to ensure that we have the endoderm, right? So the three germ layers. Okay, so we're going to go back in time. See if I can. Okay. Okay, so this is supposed to be like the uterus. Then you have like the fallopian tubes, right? Then you have your ovary. Okay, so during ovulation, right, you get a release of like the egg, right? And then the uh, fimbrae here is going to like draw up the egg. It's going to like, like draw it up into the fallopian tube. And then somewhere around like the ampulla, right? Somewhere along the ampulla, the sperm, right, there's going to be a lot of these guys. They're all going to like migrate and they're going to fertilize the egg somewhere along the ampulla, right? So the egg will be fertilized here. Right? The ampulla of um, the fallopian tube. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. All right, at this point, that the egg that was ovulated has become uh, fertilized, all right? So the major thing that we're seeing here is that we're seeing uh, this pronuclei. So one of them is coming from your, your mom, one of them is coming from your dad, all right? Because the sperm had what, it had um, DNA, right? And the DNA entered the egg, right? So what we have is DNA from mom, and then we have DNA from dad, right? Okay, so another thing is that surrounding the, um, well, the zygote, or yeah, surrounding the zygote, you're gonna have the the I think this is this is zona pellucida, yeah. You'll have the zona pellucida, right? And the zona pellucida is very is like is very um like it's very strong. So from here, you're gonna have cleavage. So the the zygote is gonna start to divide, right? And it's gonna start to undergo cleavage. And so cleavage is basically you're getting like uh, rapid division, but you're not getting any like growth in size. So like the cell is dividing, but you're not getting any growth in size. And one of the reasons is because of the zona pellucida, it's actually like restricting like growth, right? The zona pellucida, because it's very thick or it's very like strong. So it's restricting like the growth of these cells. So you're getting division, but you're not getting a growth in size, right? And so, this is occurring. So once this egg right here is fertilized, so now it's moving along, right? Right, so it's like moving along, right? So as it's moving along, you're gonna be getting the cleavage occurring, right? You're gonna be getting uh, this compaction occurring, right? So I guess the cells are um, coming together and then they're forming junction. And then from here, you're getting uh, differentiation. 
So what happens is the cells divide and stuff like that. Depending on the location of the cell, the cells are going to differentiate. All right. So you're going to have the inner cell mass. I see it. Inner cell mass. You're going to have the outer cell mass. Or outer, is it outer cell, outer, outer cell mass. But these guys are going to become your um, your trophoblasts. All right. And these guys here, the ICM, are going to become your embryoblasts. So once again, so here you see, at this point here, we're going to get cavitation. So inside here, we're going to start forming a cavity. Right? And these cells right here in red, this is your inner cell mass, right? So these are these cells right here. And then surrounding these cells right here, you, these are your trophoblasts. Right? So the trophoblasts is what's going to give rise to your placenta. Right? The inner cell mass is what's going to give rise to your embryo, the embryo proper. Cool? Uh, is anyone confused so far? Is there anyone that's confused so far? Okay. So now this is the thing, right? So you guys remember, right? So this is occurring as, as the zygote is moving along, right? So after a certain while, what's going to happen is that when it's ready, it's going to then implant, right? It's going to implant in the uterus. All right? So it's going to implant here, but not yet. All right? So it turns out that before it can implant, it needs to lose that zone of pellucida. All right? So what happens is that so from here, right, it actually comes out of that zone of pellucida. All right? So it comes out of the, the zone of hatching or whatever. So from here now, it implants onto the, uh, the uterus. Right, so you get implantation. All right, so once you get the implantation, all right, then what happens is that this inner cell mass, which is going to become your embryo proper, all right, it is now going to differentiate into your epiblast and your hypoblast. So that's what we're seeing here. So this right here, right here, this is your epiblast. And this is your hypoblast. Okay. So we have the epiblast, we have the hypoblast. Epiblast, hypoblast coming from the inner cell mass, which is also called the embry embryoblast, right? So all that is surrounded by a trophoblast, which is going to become your placenta, right? So all this stuff is, is already implanted, right? So at this point, at this, at this stage, it's no longer out here, it's, 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 it's implanted, right? That's right, so it is implanted. Okay, something that is worth pointing out here. The, the trophoblast does not become, not the, sorry, the hypoblast. So the hypoblast, it does not become the embryo proper. What becomes the embryo proper is the epiblast. So the major thing that we're concerned with here is the epiblast, all right? The trophoblast is going to actually, it's going to line the yolk sac. So this cavitation here is eventually going to become the yolk sac. It will eventually become the yolk sac. So from here, right, so we still see the cavitation. We still see it here. Then here, what happens is that this hypoblast, is they're, they're actually going to move and they're going to encircle this area here. And then this becomes your yolk sac, right? Then what happens is that this epiblast, it's going to form a cavitation. And then that cavitation becomes the um, amniotic cavity, all right? And then the major thing we're going to be concerned with is the cells that are going to be like around this area, all right? So this is the thing, okay? So, so remember that this is... Um, so you got to be thinking in a three-dimensional way, right? Because a lot of times, I, I know what threw me off was that I wasn't thinking in a three-dimensional way. And the way they showed a lot of the pictures is like cross-sections. So you got to be able to kind of visualize what you're looking at, right? So just remember that everything is occurring in a three-dimensional way, right? And you got to you got to um, focus on where like where the embryo is, what is actually becoming the embryo. It's like Okay, so in this case here, right, 
So if you're looking at this whole thing right here, the only thing that you're concerned with, the major thing you're concerned with is this. Why? Because this is the, this was, this is the yolk sac and this is the amniotic like cavity. So the embryo is actually right here. So you, like all this is just like, it's supposed to throw you off. It's supposed to confuse you. So the major thing you gotta be, you just gotta look right here. Like this is your focus. Like that's what I didn't get first year so that and I was very confused until I discovered that but anyhow you guys are pretty smart so you guys <laughs> okay okay all right so this is the thing right so this here this is the epiblast this here this is the hypoblast this is what's going to become your embryo. This is just lining the yolk sac. It has nothing to do with the actual embryo. All right. Okay, but at this stage right here, we have the bilaminar disc. All right. So now what happens is that the epiblast, meaning uh, the, the cells here, right? The epiblast, what's going to happen is that, uh, so you're going to get like an invagination. Right, of that epiblast, so, and that's going to form the what's known as the primitive streak. So if you can imagine, um, so these cells will just, you know, they, they will start like diving in. They will start diving in, and as they dive in, they form like a line, and that's like your primitive streak. So what happens is that that epiblast, as the cells are diving in, is going to give rise to the mesoderm and the endoderm. All right. All right, so epiblast, once the cells start to dive in, that's your pr forms your primitive streak. As the cells dive in, they give rise to your endoderm and your mesoderm. Let's see if there's a better picture here. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, so what is this cavity right here? Amniotic cavity, that's right. And what would this be? Okay, that's your two yolk sac, that's right. When you say yolk sac, does that thing fill with fluid just so it's like yolk and not just like chicken egg, or is that just hollow? <laughs> I think at th I think I think at this stage I think it's a cavity. Okay. I was actually a bit confused with that too. It's I think at this stage it's, it's a cavity. Like, um, it's like a comparative anatomy thing where like yeah. all placental animals and non placental they'll have a yolk sac. But in placental animals, it will just shrink up because you're actually getting nourishment from the enzymes that are forming the fluid and stuff like that. So, does so it have like fluid? It's, the same, it's a similar to the one in the chicken egg, except there is stage for it develop. But in the placental animal, it will just shrink up and kind of shrivel. Oh, okay. Fluid. Okay. And like, just mm. get really small and unnerved. Like okay, that's a good point. So, we're definitely going to we're going to see that in a little bit. So, basically, this is really going to like, like, it's going to get compacted yeah. and it will become insignificant. And I guess this is this is the this is this the amniotic cavity. Amniotic, okay, whatever. <laughs> cavity. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this one. Okay, so this this is the one that's gonna have the fluid, right? So, yeah. so right here, right? So you see it, right? You see how it like what you're saying? So it shrivels up, right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, around here that'll be what, uh, what the picture says. Okay, so is there anyone that's confused so far? Is there anyone confused so far? No. Okay, wait. Say that one more time. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, okay, all right, so I'm going to clarify. Okay, so what happens is, right, originally, all right, so originally, right, you have the um, the hypoblast, and you have the epiblast. So what happens is that during that invagination, the cells that become the endoderm, they push, they push out, like they, they, they push the, um, the hypoblast cells to the side. So, uh, let's see. Mm -hmm, that's right. 
So this would be your hypoglyphs, right? And this would be this is the this is the endoderm. It's coming from the cells that have invaginated. Some of them will become the mesoderm, and then some of them will become the endoderm. But the endoderm will push aside that hypoblast. All right, and the hypoblast is the one that's surrounding the yolk sac. Does everyone see that? So the primitive streak is how you're forming the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. Did everyone get that? This is really this is key. So the, the ectoderm is left from the cells that don't migrate. Yes. Okay. Did you mention what happens to the hypoblast? What happens there? So the hypoblast <laughs> it goes along it goes to um, line. It goes to line the the, um, <coughs> the yolk sac. And that's the yolk sac. Yeah, yeah. This will be your yolk. Sac. This is your yolk sac right here. Well, the future yolk sac, of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's the yolk sac in the making. Cool. And the endoderm's only matched this up. Yeah. Mhm. Mm that's right. And it does. Okay. So let's see what we got here. Uh. You <laughs> okay, so let me just go through everything. Uh, let me just go through everything really fast. Very quickly. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, so what we're saying is that you have the ovary undergoes ovulation, right? It releases the egg. Mm -hmm. Then somewhere at the ampulla, right, in your fallopian tube, the sperm meets with the egg, and then it gets you get the fertilization and you get the formation of the zygote. From that point on, you're gonna get division. You get cleavage, right? Mm -hmm. So you get division without cell growth. And that's as, as this, you know, developing zygote, it's moving along, right? So you get the, uh, you get the cleavage, you get the compaction, right? And you get the differentiation, right? So depending on where the cells, all the cells, you know, um, all the cells that are multiplying and stuff like that, depending on the location of the cell, right, they will differentiate. So the ones on the inside will become your inner cell mass, and the ones on the outs outside will become the outer cell mass. The outer cell mass will become your trophoblast, which is your future placenta. All right, the inner cell mass is the one that's going to become the embryo proper. But what happens is that that inner cell mass, you're going to get a cavitation occurring there, and that's going to become your future yolk sac, right? But so um, then from uh, from this point on, what would happen is that you would like the zygote, or I don't know what to call it, the embryo at this point, it would break off from that, that zone of pellucida because it was, it's um, kind of, it's like it was restricting it and stuff. And um, uh, it needs to break off from that zone of pellucida in order to attach onto the uterine wall. And that's what we have here. Once it breaks off from that zone of pellucida, it can now implant into the uterine wall. And then from here, the inner inner cell mass, right? It's now going to differentiate, right, into your epiblast and your hypoblast. The embryo proper is in the epiblast. The hypoblast is only going to line the yolk sac, right? So, um, yeah. So then, what happens is that you get another cavitation in the epiblast. All right, so you get another cavitation in the epiblast. All right, so the first cavitation was in the inner cell mass. The second cavitation is going to be in your epiblast. And that second cavitation will become your amniotic cavity. All right. At this point, we have the bilaminar disc. Now, what happens is that the epiblast cells, right, epiblast cells, they are going to invaginate. And they're going to form the primitive streak. Right, and as those cells are invaginating and they're moving, right to different locations, they're gonna they're gonna form your endoderm, and they're gonna form your mesoderm, right? And um, yeah, so that's what that's what we see here, All right? So the formation of the primitive streak. So it's your endoderm, then you're gonna get like formation of your mesoderm, and this will be like your ectoderm. Okay, so did everyone get that? You're not looking at cavities. You can just look at lines of cells and then that's what you're looking at, right? Hmm? Sorry? You're not looking at like the whole cavity. Go back to that picture. 
Yeah. This is right here? Yeah. You're not looking at the hole. You're looking at the line. Can you see? Right here? Yeah, yeah, you're not looking at, yeah, yeah, you're not looking at the, yeah, that's it, that's a confusing thing. Yeah, that's it, that's a deception. So, you want to look just here, just focus here. Okay. This is where everything is happening. This is just like, uh, this is deception. They're trying to trick you guys. No. You gotta know what you're looking for. Okay, so, okay, so let's, let's, okay, let's, let's go a little bit further. Okay, so the epiblast cells, they migrate, become your mesoderm, endoderm, and then the one that's left over is your ectoderm. All right, so it turns out that there are three types of mesoderm. All right, so you're going to have your paraxial mesoderm. You're going to have your intermediate mesoderm, and you're going to have your lateral plate mesoderm. All right, so paraxial mesoderm, is the one that is right next to your neural tube. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But So you got paraxial, intermediate, and then you have the lateral, the lateral plate mesoderm. Okay, so, so when the epiblast is migrating in, right, and then you're forming the mesoderm, so parts of the mesoderm is actually going to break off and then form this, your notochord. So your notochord is going to induce the ectoderm, right, to form a neural plate. All right. So when the epiblast migrates in, forms the mesoderm, forms the endoderm, part of the mesoderm is going to form this your notochord. The notochord is going to induce the the um, the ectoderm, so it will induce the cells here to form the neural plate. And it did, what happens is that once the neural plate is formed, that neural plate will invaginate, and you would form the neural tube. Right? Okay, so we have the neural tube, we have the notochord, we have the paraxial mesoderm, we have the intermediate mesoderm, we have the lateral plate mesoderm. All right, now, is there anything here that's confusing to you guys? Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, so. There are two kinds of lateral plate mesoderm. So you have the somatic lateral plate mesoderm, this one right here. That's the one that is moving with the ectoderm. Okay. It's, it's like moving like alongside the ectoderm, right? And so you guys remember, so above here would be the amniotic cavity. Mm -hmm. Below here would be the, the, the yolk sac. Or the yolk sac, right? Yeah, or the, or the yolk sac, right? But our the major concern is this. This is this is what we care about. Everything else is it's not really critical. Okay, yeah, so there are two kinds of lateral plate mesoderm. So you have the somatic lateral plate mesoderm, which is the one that is following the ectoderm, and then you have the splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm, which is following the endoderm. Right? The endoderm is right here. Right? I just want this stuff to make sense because I feel like I feel like it makes sense uh, and then um, but depending on how you look at it, it can be really confusing. I have a question. So the notochord yeah. makes the neural tube. Yeah. So does it do anything else or does it go away afterwards? Okay. So I, I'm pretty sure it does a lot of other things. Okay. Uh, but from what I know, so it releases it releases noggin and cordon, mm -hmm. and the noggin and the cordon induces the ec the overlying ectoderm. Okay, so this is not here to begin with. Okay. This is not here to begin with. This comes first, and then it induces the ectoderm here, right, by secreting the noggin and the cordon, and this will now become, like, uh, it will become a neural plate, a neural tissue or whatever. And then that will invaginate. That will invaginate, and then that will give rise to the neural tube. Right? And then coming off of the neural tube, you're going to have neural crest cells. Oh, because you form a neural crest first, right? Is that what happens? Uh, so from... Right. You have the notochord secreting the visual molecules. Invagination of the ectoderm happens. It forms a neural crest first. Like the actual invagination forms the neural crest. 
and all of a sudden wait, 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 wait. Mm -hmm. wait so the neural crest the neural crest are cells that break off of the neural tube yeah the Um, it's, mm, that's a good question. I will, okay, so I will go into a bunch of them. I will go into, like, what they form. Yeah, so you see how, like, it's like you create. When you're done with them, can you just go over the naming again? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so, um, so what's going on? Where are we at? Okay, so so what 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 were you saying? Sorry, what were you saying? Oh, because from the picture that Sean has in her PowerPoint, it looks like you have the invagination of your exoderm, and then you she labels it as the neural crest, and then you actually form this tube, and it seems like it's from yeah, cells of the neural crest, and yeah. then. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so, so let's let's look at this one. Let's look at this again. So what we're saying is, right? So this is what we're saying. Okay, so we have. Okay. Mm. All right. So if this here is the epiblast, and this is your hypoblast, all right. So the epiblast and the hypoblast, they were coming from what? Where were the epiblast and the hypoblast coming from? Hmm? Embryo blast. Okay. Okay, so we got the epiblast, right? We got epiblast, right? We got the hypoblast. So above this, what would be here? So that would be amniotic cavity, right? And then what would be below here? Yolk sac. Yolk sac, right? Okay, so what, what's going to happen is that the cells here, the cells, the cells around here. They they are gonna they're gonna invaginate, right? And then they're gonna break off, right? And they're gonna form the they're gonna form the mesoderm and the endoderm. Mm -hmm. So they took the hypoblast out of the way. Exactly. Okay. So these cells here now will go on to form your mesoderm and your endoderm. Uh, I think uh, I think he was referring to. Uh, I think he was. I think he was at least from the lecture. I, th I think he was referring to the lateral plate mesoderm. You're talking about the mesenchyme and the little limb body thing, right? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. So what's going to happen is that the endoderm and the endoderm is going to push aside. Like they're gonna like push aside the the hypoblast, so the hypoblast is is gonna like move like this way, right? But um, what will happen is that you would now have like like this would be this would now be endoderm, right? And then you would have mesoderm. And we said there were there were uh, three major mesodermal tissue.
What were those three major music drama tissues? Okay, so we got uh, paraxial. All right, so this is so this is paraxial, right? Then we got the intermediate, and then we have the the lateral plate. All right. Okay, so we formed this primitive streak, right? Um, so it turns out that part of these the mesoderm will form the nodal cord, right? So part of the mesoderm, right, will become the nodal cord. And what happens is that the nodal cord, right, this, this guy here is now gonna, you know, it's gonna be, be releasing some signals, so it's gonna be releasing the, the cordon the noggin actually kind of makes sense because it's your noggin your head your brain huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay so like okay so it's them releasing these signals right and what's going to happen is that this over this overlying ectoderm right is going to induce the overlying ectoderm to become your neural plate right so then what happens is that once you form the neural plate, then the neural plate is going to invaginate, right? And when the neural plate invaginates, right, so maybe you can think of something like this. So let's just say, let's just say, let's just say like all this is the ectoderm, right? And let's say that this is the neural plate, right? So once the neural plate fully invaginates, then you would have the ectoderm, and then this here would be the, um, the neural tube. All right, D did you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, so the, the, this neural tube is actually going to uh, become your spinal cord and uh, it's going to make up like uh, your brain and also your motor neurons but um, we'll get into that in a little bit okay so nodal cord induces the formation of the neural plate neural plate invaginates you get the neural tube right so then we we, we said that there was three type three types of mesoderm paraxial intermediate lateral plate mesoderm there was two kinds of lateral plate mesoderm there was a somatic and there was a splanchnic. The somatic is the one that will be following the ectoderm. Right? The somatic one is going to be the one that's going to be following the ectoderm. And the splanchnic one is going to be following your, your endoderm. Right? Um, you know, later on you're going to have like, you're going to have like some, um, you're going to have like lateral folding. That will be going on later on. Okay, so D did you guys get this? Okay, cool. All right, so what happens after this is that you actually get um, you actually get lateral folding, right? So let's just look at this. This should make sense at this point. This is your what? This is your amniotic cavity. This is what? This is the yolk sac. This is the what? This is the uh, ectoderm. This is your endoderm. All right? And all this stuff here is mesoderm. You guys see that? Yeah. Okay, let, let, let me erase this so you guys can see this again. Yeah. Okay, so remember, right? Remember? So remember how we're... So what is... What, what is the thing that's happening here is that this part here is going to push down like so, and then this part here will be pushing down like so. But it's still the same concept. Um, so, okay. So remember, remember where the ectoderm is. This is ectoderm. This here is ectoderm. This here is endoderm, and all this this is mesoderm. And then you have the neural tube there, right? Then the nodal cord. So if you look here, right? If you look here, 
This is what's going to become the future neural tube. This is your notochord. Mm -hmm. This is the paraxial mesoderm. This here is the intermediate mesoderm. This is the somatic lateral plate mesoderm. Oh. This is the splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm. Do you see that? The one on the one on top is the somatic. somatic. The one that's lining. So it, that should make sense, right? Because it's soma uh, um, body. Um, yeah, splanchnic. Splanchnic doesn't make too much sense. Splanchnic is the one that goes with the endoderm. Can you repeat that one more time? Um, uh, let's see. That's a good question. Mm, yeah, it's just a little bit. Of, let me see. Yeah, it's a little bit. It's a little bit confusing to me in this case here. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure. What I can tell you is that I can tell you that the endoderm, the the splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm is following along with the endoderm. That's what I can tell you. Okay, so, but the major, the, the major thing is this, all right? The major thing is this. The major thing is that you're going you're gonna to have, like, these two ends moving along like so. So you're getting a, um, you're getting a lateral uh, folding. And um, at the end of the day, it's going to result in this. All right, so what do we see here? So this here would be, like, all the ectoderm, right? Right. Yeah. This is the neural tube, right? Mm -hmm. That's the notochord. Yeah. This is the paraxial mesoderm. Yeah. This is the intermediate mesoderm, right? Now notice this right here will be what? What's this? That, that would fall into the right? Exactly. Yeah. That's right. That's the gut tube. That's right. Mm -hmm. Notice oh, that. Notice. Okay. You, so you guys notice that when you're looking at that yolk sac, right? So notice when you're looking at the yolk sac, right? Well, what is lining the yolk sac? It was the endoderm mm -hmm. and the hypoblast, mm -hmm. right? So the endoderm was originally lining the, uh, the yolk sac. So let's see here. Uh, where am I at? Okay, here. Okay. So what happens is that when you get this lateral folding, right? you're going to end up forming a uh, body cavity. This right here. So this is your celomic, this is, this is celomic cavity. So this, this celomic cavity is actually, it becomes your, so it becomes like your thoracic cavity and like your abdominal cavity. And what happens is that later on, that cavity is actually divided by your, um, what is this thing? Your diaphragm, your diaphragm. So the septum transversum is going to divide it. So that's how you're going to get the vision of your your thoracic cavity and like your abdominal cavity, all right? But I don't think they went this far in the lectures. But okay, so this is the endoderm, right? The endoderm is what forms the gut tube. So this would actually like form. This would be like your gut tube, and the gut tube will actually like give rise to like your intestinal tract, uh, stomach. I think it gives rise to like I think it gives rise to pancreas and liver if I'm not wrong. Um, it al it also gives rise to the lung buds and actually give rise to structures uh, associated with the lungs. But um, okay, so this does this make sense? Okay. Now okay, so we talked about how the lateral plate mesoderm has two parts, right? What were the two parts of the lateral plate mesoderm? Okay, so what what is the splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm lining? Endoderm. Okay, so the endoderm, right? Okay, now this is the thing. So your your paraxial mesoderm, it's going to become your somite, your somites, right? But um, okay, so so this paraxial mesoderm will become your somites. And there will be a, like a whole bunch of them, and they're going to be segmented all along your back. So we're assuming that this is your back now, right? So we're assuming at this point this is the posterior, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the anterior. That's what we're assuming at this point because because the neural tube is going to become your spinal cord, mm -hmm. all right? And then it's going to give rise to like your brain, all right? Okay, so question. Yeah. 
so just looking at that, how are we like oriented? Are we looking at it like straight on, or I mean like from? Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? Is it transverse? Yes. Let's see. We're still looking at it in this way. Do you, do you, I mean, are you fam are you like able to visualize yeah, this? Yeah, that way I, I can see that. Yeah, so it's still the same. It's still the same thing, but the only difference is that no. we we have we still have like. Well, actually, no, that would be that'd be a little bit misleading. Wait, one second. Okay, so see the only difference here is that. Okay, so see this ectoderm right here. The ectoderm, the ectoderm has actually completely surrounded the, um, I guess the embryo or right. the, the ectoderm has completely surrounded the structures. Now you're not so like maybe somewhere out here, you would have maybe some uh, some cavity. So the cavities are not like you're you're okay. So out here will probably be like your amniotic cavity, and here here, while it would have been your yolk sac. But it becomes like the gut tube, like it takes it off, and then like. But what I'm saying is like, yeah, like how the tube was like, a, of like cutting it open, it's like a ball still inside. You yeah, it's like a ball, isn't it? Like it's the actual. Like the tube, like the GI tube, the tube is like a ball. Like oh, the G, oh, the GI tube. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. So it's you know it's it, yeah it's like a gastrointestinal tract, you know, something like that. And then depending on where you're at, it would differentiate. So if you're up here, it will actually it will actually give rise to your lung buds. And then lower on, like your stomach, um, your intestines, um, I believe pancreas and liver also comes from it. The, the cavity under the endocrine, where does it where does it come from? Where does it this right here? Are you talking about this right here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is not a very good depiction. Yeah, okay. So you guys want to like um, maybe the uh, the lecture given by Dr. Shaw. So you look at that folding very well because this is not a very good. Um, if I'm looking at, it, I'm like, what the heck is going on here? But um, yeah, there's a there's, there's a. Posted a couple of pictures. Dr. Shaw, she posted a couple of pictures to show the different types. She kind of got a sense. What, what is the area called again? Is it electrical or? Uh, or which? Which that I was just referencing that under the endocrine. This right here. Yeah. I believe this should be the celiac cavity from the. Um, Okay, so um, let's see here. Okay. Okay, so the thing I, w I wanted to mention is that, okay, so we have the paraxial mesoderm. The paraxial mesoderm becomes your somites, and there are three different kinds of somites. Right? Or there's three different parts to the somites. All right? So you have your sclerotome. Right? You have your myotome. And you have your dermatome. That's what you're seeing here, right? Here you're seeing uh, you have the myotome, right? This would probably be like another part of that somite. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so we're gonna be seeing this in a little bit, but what happens is that the parts of that somite will migrate into the developing limb bud, right? Okay, so when you're looking at the limb bud, right? The, the bud that comes off around day okay so the, we said that the the we said that the upper limb bud develops around day it starts coming out 24 and then the lower 28 right okay so the major thing that is going to be contributing to like that like coming out so you have the lateral plate mesoderm right and you guys should know what the lateral plate mesoderm is right yeah um, lateral plate mesoderm so you do yeah, because we have you have the paraxial intermediate the lateral plate mesoderm. Okay. So the lateral plate mesoderm is going to be pushing off, right? And that's how you're kind of getting this this bud thing coming off here. And then what happens is that the, the the somite, so parts of the somite. So there's three parts of the somite. So what are the three parts? Sclerotome, myotome, dermatome, myotome. Okay. So what you're going to have is that you're going to have the myotome which is gonna uh, become the future skeletal muscles in the limb bud, myo muscle, makes sense, right? Uh, they're gonna mi be migrating into the future, you know, the side of the future limb bud, right? And then you're also gonna have the dermatome, 
right? And that kind of makes okay, dermo something skin, maybe uh, dermis something, right? So it actually gives rise to the dermis of the skin, and I believe the superficial fascia. So connective tissue. Right. Okay, so you have the dermatome and the myotome that is associated with the somite. And they're going to be migrating into that limb bud. That's what this is showing. All right. So that limb bud, the major things that is contributing to that limb bud is the lateral plate mesoderm, right? The dermatome and the myotome, and those two guys are coming from the somite. So Did you guys see that? So yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have a question? Okay. Okay, so okay, so when you're looking at that limb bud, right, the first major thing that's contributing to it is the lateral plate mesoderm, right, and then the other major thing is the parts of the uh, the somite, so the 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 sweat the the myotoma. Yeah, I'm just showing you like the major thing that is kind of like contributing to it, the major thing. Yeah, the, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm just wondering what type, because you said it was the, like there's different types of the lateral mesoderm. The lateral, the lateral plate. Mm -hmm. So the, la yeah, the lateral plate. So is it the somatic or is it the splenic or does it not matter? Yeah, it, it, it wasn't said. It wasn't said. It's just lateral plate mesoderm. It wasn't specified. Yeah, in the case of like your the formation of your heart, your heart is coming from the splenic lateral plate mesoderm, but... um. It wasn't like, spe it was not specified. So, um, just okay. lateral plate mesoderm. Got it. Yeah. Um, when you said the dermatomes uh, migrate to form, or you said that they migrate onto to the limb bud, but would they migrate anywhere along the spinal or the uh, pectoral? Yeah, so the, uh, the dermatome, yeah, they could migrate to other locations apart from the limb bud. Um, yeah, but, you know, since we're focusing on the limb, <laughs> so, okay, uh, is there anyone that's confused? So for this part, I know this is a little bit, this is a little bit, um, confusing, but you guys reference Shah's lecture, uh, it'll probably be a better diagram as to, like, the folding, but just know that when it does fold, you get, like, a cavity being formed, and then you get the actual gut tube being formed. As a, as a consequence of it, right? Okay, so any questions? Is there anyone that's confused? So I think the, these are like the major, these are the major key things. These are the major key things for the, the whole embryo. embryo. Yeah, so you, do, you have like anterior, like uh, the cranial, Caudal folding as well, but um, yeah. Does that take place after, right after this kind of joint? I'm not 100 percent sure. It's probably the same. Um, okay, I'm not 100 percent sure uh, as to the time that it takes place, but you would have um, like cranial, like cranial caudal folding as well. Okay. All right. So. Okay, so the things that we're going to talk about now should kind of, should make more sense, you know, since we've kind of established the embryo embryological aspect of this, right? And there's no one that's confused. Right? No one is confused, right? All right. Are you guys still here? Okay, so um, so we talked about we talked about the upper limb bud appearing day twenty four, right? The lower limb bud is appearing day twenty eight, right? We talked about how we needed a trilaminar embryo, right, in order to form this. We already talked about the gastrulation. Well, well the gastrulation is just where you form the primitive streak, right? Right. Uh, then we already talked about the mesoderms that were forming, right? We talked about the paraxial. We talked about the intermediate mesoderm, right? We talked about the lateral plate mesoderm. Right? 
then we said that for the paraxial mesoderm, there are three parts associated with it. We said that it would give rise to your somite, and then that has three components. So you have the sclerotome, the myotome, and the dermatome. The, the sclerotome is going to give rise to your, the, your, ver, like your, your axial skeleton. So it's going to give rise to like your, um, your vertebral columns and like your ribs, the sclerotome. Your myotome is going to give rise to myocytes, which will give rise to myofibrils, which will give rise to the striated muscle. And remember, these guys are the ones that were moving into the limb bud. So you can imagine as they're moving into the limb bud, then they can form the future muscle of the limb bud, right? Yeah. And then the, the, the dermatome would also be moving into the future limb bud, right? And so you could imagine that when, as it's moving into the future limb bud, right, it would give rise to the dermis and superficial fascia. And remember, we talked about this, right? And we talked about how this is superficial fascia, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then associated with your skin, so the skin you have what? You have the, um, the epidermis and you have the dermis. So the dermis is like the, the lower part of the skin, right? So I'm just showing you guys where the stuff is coming from, right? Showing you where the stuff is coming from. All right. Uh, then we said we had a lateral clade mesoderm. Uh, then uh, there's a somatic and a splanchnic part. And what what is important about this lateral clade mesoderm? What's important about this? That's what actually you guys are making from mm -hmm. the like the visit from your upper and lower limb That's right. Okay. Yeah. So the lateral clade mesoderm would be, um, yeah moving out to form the, uh, the, the bulge. Okay, so then we already talked about the endoderm and uh, the notochord. Um, let's see here. Yeah, the notochord forms from the mesoderm. We said that. Um, boom, boom, boom. We already talked about that. So we talked about the neural crest cells, right? They're breaking off in the neural tube, right? Okay, cool. Okay, so we talked about the components of the limb bud. So we said that um, it's, it's coming, it's being created by the bulging out of this lateral plate mesoderm, right? So we said. And we said that there's going to be a migration of the dermatome and the myotome into the limb bud, right? Now, where, where's the dermatome and the myotome coming from? The somite. So what were the three parts of the somite? Okay, so what does sclerotome become? Okay, so what does sclerotome become? Okay, so what, it's what specifically? Vertebrae and ribs. Okay, the vertebrae and ribs. So what does a myotome become? Okay, so the muscles, that's right. Uh, and how about the dermatome? Okay, not the skin though, it's the dermis of the skin. So when you have when when you have the skin, right? So you have you have the so you have the epidermis, right? Right. And then you have you have the dermis, and then you have the hypodermis, right? So, but this is what we're talking about for the dermatome, right? All right, so we talked about the components of the limb bud. So now the thing is, uh, we need to consider how we form, how the limb bud is actually growing lengthwise. All right, so we talked about the components of it. Now we're talking about how does it actually grow um, in a proximal, like distal way, like, so how does it grow lengthwise? Okay, so you guys already know what the lateral plate mesoderm is, right? So this your lateral plate mesoderm is going to secrete fibroblasts, fibroblasts, is fibro growth, what is it, fibroblasts, fibro growth fast, can someone please help me, okay so fibroblasts growth factor 10, all right, all right so this is what is, it's inducing right, the bulge to appear at the limb side, all right. So what happens is that this lateral plate mesoderm is also going to secrete 
bone morphogenic protein 5. Right? And the purpose of this bone morphogenic protein 5 is that it's going to induce the thickening um, of the ectoderm. And what we're talking about is, let's see here. Okay, so you see that all this is ectoderm, right? Mm -hmm. This is ectoderm. Mm -hmm. So this right here. So that bone morphogenic protein 5 is going to induce that to thicken, right? And that's how you're going to form your AER. This is your apical ectodermal ridge. This is how you're forming your AER, all right? So what happens is that that bone morphogenic protein 5, it causes that, uh, the, that ectoderm, to, it becomes more columnar, right? They become more columnar. So they'll be the cells of your AER, right? And what happens is that once you have this AER, the apical ectodermal ridge, right? It's now going to secrete its own factors, so such as fibro growth, fibroblast growth factor four, and fibroblast growth factor eight, right? So fibroblast growth factors, right? So the AER is going to secrete these factors, and what these factors are going to do is that it's going to maintain uh, your progress zone. So the progress zone is just, is just a zone where you have a lot of um, like growth, a lot of mitotic activity. And uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can show you this example here. Okay, so here. So you can imagine, okay, so this is the limb bud, right? This is the limb bud. Anterior, posterior, right? So this is probably, what, what would you think this would be? Lateral plate mesoderm, right? So the lateral plate mesoderm, um, how is it going to induce the formation of this apical ectodermal ridge, this after, AER? After that's out? Okay. No, that's not right. BMP5. BMP5. So BMP5 is going to induce the formation of this apical ectodermal ridge. So the cells there are going to become more columnar, right? And when the cells become more columnar, then they are, they are now going to secrete factors. What factors were they going to secrete? Okay, so fibroblast growth factor 4 and 8. And um, that's going to lead to the creation of this progress zone. This right here, this thing here. Right? And this progress zone is basically where you have a lot of mitotic activity. And um, so what happens is that behind this progress zone, um, you, you get... Uh, you get mesenchymal condensation and uh, so that's how you're actually going to form cartilage so again not around here not around the progress zone but behind the progress zone you get co like condensation of the mesenchyme or the lateral plate mesoderm so the lateral plate mesoderm is going to condense and that's how you're going to get the cartilage appearing and then the cartilage can then ossify, and that's how you get your bone. You guys get that? Yeah. Okay, so when I say condensation, does it then connect all the different chondrosomes? Um. Okay, so I'm not sure about specifics. I'm I'm going off of uh, what I remember from the lecture. Okay, so I listened to the lecture from last year. So what I got was they are going to uh, like somehow condense and form this, start forming like bone or cartilage and then it later becomes bone. That's what I got out of it. I'm not sure if like they just somehow like change into like um, chondroblast or like maybe osteocyte something. Yeah. Okay, so um, does this make sense so far? Yes? So this is how we're getting the proximal distal um, lengthening, right, of that li li limb bud. Right. So one more time, lateral plate mesoderm secretes fibroblast growth factor 10. It induces the bulge to appear. Um, the lateral plate mesoderm also secretes bone morphogenic protein 5. It's going to induce 
the formation of your AER. Once your AER is formed, it's going to secrete fibroblast growth factors, and that's going to maintain the progress zone. Behind the progress zone, you're going to get thickening of your mesenchyme, you get cartilage formation, and then that becomes later becomes bald. Cool? It's not too, this is not too critical. Okay, so we just talked about how we're getting the uh, lengthening. So, but now how do we establish the anterior posterior axis? All right. So it turns out that there is a cluster of cells at a location called the zone of polarizing activity. All right. So here, right here. So there's a cluster of cells right here. At, um, at your zone of polarizing activity. And these cells are going to be secreting sonic, uh, well, okay, so they're gonna release vitamin A, which is gonna lead to the expression of sonic hedgehog. Okay, I'm not gonna interrupt you, but in the next slide it says lateral media, is that the same thing? Uh, lateral media axis? Yeah, it's probably, it's probably, let me see, lateral. Uh, yeah, so what am I gonna, let me see. Lateral medial. Did he? Did he have anything the, else? Did he yeah, have? The anatomical position is like wrong because yeah, it, in a developing embryo, it's technically like still superior, but we consider it lateral. Yeah. I guess lateral medial and anterior posterior still opposite, regardless. I just they just said it different. So I yeah, it's a, it gets a little bit. Um, yeah, but I mean, you can kind of see here, right, from this orientation. I just don't know what you're Yeah. Um, yeah. Mecca, if you look at the slide, he has a picture of like the developing fetus, and you can see how it's the same slide. You can see it better. It just shows it anterior posterior. It's the same thing. Okay, so we're almost done. We're almost on three. Okay, so. Okay, so anterior posterior axis. You got zone of polarizing activity. You got release of vitamin A. You get expression of sonic hedgehog. And that's how you're getting the anterior posterior axis generation. Did you guys get that? Okay, now this one was, a, this. okay, so this one, I, I'm gonna tell you guys right now, this one was a little bit confusing to me. All right. Now, I didn't see this in his lecture. I got this from the last year lecture so that you guys might wanna be a little bit careful um, but I'm just putting it on there because, I mean, I think it will kind of give you an idea of how it's working. All right. So how we're establishing the dorsal ventral axis. So the major thing is that you're going to have bone morphogenic proteins. And they're going to be acting on dorsally located ectoderms. All right. And they're going to they're gonna lead to expression of EN1, which is going to switch on WNT7A genes which is gonna lead to the release of LMX1, which specifies dorsally located cells. All right, I know it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, um, it's a lot going on there. The major thing I would say, the major thing would be this here, um, the WNT7 A gene, all right, um, in terms of like specifying the dorsal ventral axis. So here, this is just another example here. So in terms of lengthening, right? So in terms of lengthening, right? So for the lengthening, we said we had the what? We had the AER, right? Mm -hmm. The AER was being formed by what? The lateral, the lateral, lateral, plate lateral plate mesoderm, right? Secreting what? What was the lateral plate mesoderm secreting? BMP5. Okay, so BMP5. Lateral plate mesoderm secretes BMP5 which leads to our AER, right? AER is now formed. AER now secretes what? FGF4 and 8. So here, FGF4. So this is how you're getting the lengthening, FGF4 and 8. Fibroblast growth factor, right? That's for lengthening, all right? So um, anterior, posterior. Okay, so anterior, posterior. So 
So remember, we have the zone of polarizing activity. So we have a cluster of cells there, right? You're going to have vitamin A uh, leading to the creation of sonic hedgehog. And then that's the presence of that sonic hedgehog is going to um, create the anterior posterior axis, right? Then in terms of dorsal ventral, right, dorsal ventral, the key thing is this WINT 7A, right? WINT 7A is going to be specifying dorsal, right, dorsal. It's a more dorsally located structure, right? You guys get that? Fibroblast growth factor, lengthening, sonic hedgehog, anterior, posterior, WINT 7A, dorsal, ventral. Cool? So this is how we are specifying the different um, axes and, you know, you know, getting different things forming in different locations, right? Okay, now, this dorsal ventral axis formation is important. Why? Because it's going to be determining our flexors and our extensors. Now, so where, where, where are our flexors normally? So ventral, right? Ventral. Ventral flexors are going to be ventral. And how about the extensors? Dorsal. Dorsal. All right, so this is a, maybe another thing that is also important to kind of point out. So we talked about we talked about how we talked about how the the uh, the myotome. So we said the myotome and the dermatome is going to migrate into what the developing limb bud, right? Mm -hmm. You guys remember that, right? So it turns out that the myotome that actually migrates, right, it's going to um, form a kind of sandwich with the lateral plate mesoderm, right? And so let me see if I can show you guys this really fast. So here. So if this here is your myotome, right? So when it migrates into that developing limb bud, right? What you're going to have here is like a myotome on the top, myotome on the bottom. And then here, this is your lateral plate, you know, the lateral plate mesoderm. And then we said that it was going to condense, right? And then form what? Cartilage and then bone, right? So the precursors of your bone and your ten tendons, right? Okay, so... This kind of a sandwich kind of a thing here, this is how we're getting the ventral muscle mass and the dorsal muscle mass, right? <coughs> so these muscle masses are coming from the myotome and the myotome is coming from where? Okay, so the myotome is coming from what? The somites. And the somites are coming from where? Paraxial mesoderm. And the paraxial mesoderm is coming from where? Epiblast. that's right. Where's the epiblast coming from? Huh? The, the what? Where was it? Where's, huh? Okay, the embryoblast, that's right. So cool. Okay, so the ventral, the ventral muscle mass, so what's this gonna be? This is gonna be my flexors, this is gonna be my extensors. So it'll be my flexors, right? This is gonna be my flexors. All right. And this is gonna be my what? Extensors. Okay, cool. The ventral muscle mass? Like okay, so. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about this right here. So this right here is lateral plate mesoderm that has condensed. And when it condenses, it's going to form cartilage, and that will lead to the formation of, of bones. And here you can also see that it does lead to the formation of tendons as well. Okay, okay. I get it. All right, so we're almost done. All right, we're almost home free. We're almost home free. Okay. So is 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 there is there anything that is confusing you guys? Is there anyone that's lost? So you guys, you guys all understand this. It's like crystal clear, right? I it's crystal clear. It's crystal clear. It's clear enough for just learning it this morning. Okay. All right. That's good. All right. All right. So.
So, um, okay, so we talked about the axis seeds, right? We talked about the biotone forming the sandwich thing. So now we get into the limb identity. So what actually, what's going to specify that you have a forelimb or a hind limb? So there's these T-box genes. So in your forelimb, you're going to have the expression of TBX5, right, around the limb bud, right? And that's going to specify that it is a forelimb and not a hind, not a hind, hind limb. And then for the hind limb, around that, um, that limb bud, you're going to have the expression of TBX4. Right? And that's going to specify that it's hind limb. And maybe a way to kind of think about it is you can think, okay, so if I'm up here, so if I'm up here, right, then I'm higher, right? So then it must be five. And then if I'm over here, then it's four. So it's TBX five for the upper limb, right? TBX four for the lower limb. Kind of help you guys remember that. And this is just a little experiment, right? So here you have like the limb buds coming off of here. So this would be like the, the forelimb and this would be like the hind limb. So we said the forelimb is expressing what? Five. This is TBX5. And the hind limb is expressing what? TBX4. So what happens now is that if we take, um, so if we take, I believe this is TBX, yeah. So if we take TBX5, um, or actually if we induce the expression of TBX5, right, in, in a, a random location, that's going to lead to the development of a, another forelimb. And that's what this is showing. So here you have you have the forelimb, forelimb, right? Hind limb, hind limb, and now we just induced this part right here to express TBX5 and it became a forelimb, right? And we could do the same thing, right? We can do the exact same thing with TBX4 and we can cause a random site to express TBX4 and that will lead to a hind limb. Um, I mean, I suppose so. I mean, it looks functional to me. I think it looks pretty functional. Okay, so that's how we're specifying the limb identity. All right, and now I guess the the last major thing is the rotation of the limbs. All right, so somewhere around week seven, all right, you're gonna get rotation of the limbs so your four limbs they are going to rotate outwardly and your hind limbs are going to rotate medially all right and this is like a 90 degree rotation all right and here let me show you guys okay so here so your upper limbs right they're rotating like outwardly right and then your hind limbs are rotating what medially, right? It's about like 90 degree rotation. So what happens is that, let's see. Okay, so let's just say here, let's draw a line here. So over here, we would have, like, this would be like ventral. It would have been ventral, right? And over here would have been dorsal. All right, so what happens is that as this rotates this way, then the ventral is gonna be, like, on top, right? And then dorsal is gonna be on the back. So remember that the ventral was the flexors, mm -hmm. right? And then the dorsal was the extensors. Right, so if you're flexing, so over here, if you're flexing, you're flexing like here, like that, right? This is like flexion here. Rest over here is like you're flexing like that, but then extension is like going like that, or you're going like this. And you guys can kind of try it out like flexion is using here, like just all here, and then extension is using like your back, the muscles on the back of your head. You can try it out. Let's see. Yeah. Hmm? 
Did, did, yeah. it, okay. did everyone get that with the I can explain a little bit better I, I'm just supposing you guys kind of know it but did, did everyone get the whole extension and the flexion and the muscles on top and on the back I didn't get it at first so like, I didn't get it so okay you guys got it and that's good just the rotation of like from being an outfielder to being like your when you're jumping mm -hmm. like uh, wait you mean like the fact that it's rotating is confusing, yeah. or or is well, it like how it's rotating? Yeah, yeah how it's rotating. Like, yes. Yeah, so, so normally you're out here, like 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 you're in, like this. Oh, you're in. Yeah, you're, you're in out. like this. Yeah. yeah. And then your legs are going in. Yeah, yeah. because you're yeah. like out like this, so, so your arms are like this. Like, you know, see what it's going on? Yeah. yeah. And then they like switch out. That's why he was talking. He had like the whole spiel on anatomical position and how it's mm -hmm. wrong because he was like, when you're in utero, mm -hmm. you're actually like this, and then you go out. So this rear movement, yeah, that's what he said. Like yeah. So another thing that's uh, important. Okay. So you guys should. Okay. So when you. Okay. So here, right? This is my flexors, mm -hmm. but when I'm looking at my leg, my flexors is on the back mm -hmm. because of this rotation. So if you're trying to, okay, if you're trying to flex, like you're, you know, if I'm flexing here, it's like this, right? If I'm flexing my legs, it's like that. Right. I'm using the back to flex. Whereas in the front, I'm using these to flex. Mm -hmm. yeah, and whereas these are extending my legs. Like in the front here, they're, they're extending. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see that? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so how that, far were they out, like, originally? Like, like mm, I see. Uh, okay, so from what I saw in the lecture, so it was a it was a ninety degree rotation for the um, like for for this and this, so I mean maybe like ninety degrees from that. If you're trying to see it that way, ninety degrees from that. Cool. All right. All right. So th this is just the last thing. All right. So in terms of the the nervous tissue, like the nervous system. Neural tissue. All right, so we talked about the neural tube, right? So what induced the formation of the neural tube? Uh, the endoscopy of the What induced it? What induced it? Okay, so the notochord, right? Okay, so once we have the neural tube being formed, so the neural tube is going to um, give rise to the spinal cord, right? What's going to give rise to the ver uh, vertebra? Sclerotome. Where's the sclerotome coming from? Somites. Okay, so the somites. What are the three parts of the somites? No, wait. What are the what are the parts of the somites? Okay, cool. Okay, so the the neural tube. The neural tube is giving rise to what? The spinal cord and your motor neurons, right? The neural crest is giving rise to the peripheral nervous system, w specifically the sympathetic and auto autonomic nervous system and sensory nerves. So when you're looking at the muscles and they're getting innervated in the limbs, and you're looking at where is it coming from, you're looking at the sympathetic autonomic nervous system and the sensory nerves in your arm, it's coming from the neural crest. And then the motor neurons, um, they're going to be derived from the neural tube. Do you guys see that? And then uh, the blood vessels and the lymph, they are derived from your splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm. So where's the splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm coming from? Lateral plate mesoderm. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So you guys, you guys have become pros, right? Yeah. You guys have become yeah. pros. More like wow. that stars. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Alright. So um Okay, so I'll probably just ask you guys a couple questions uh and then we'll we'll call it a day. Um Yeah, blood vessels and lymph, yeah. Splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm.
the Spike the Glide will play music that leads to the formation of like a hard two. And then that gives rise to like, you know, blood vessels and stuff. Yeah. Oh, for the rotation. Yeah. Rotation of the um the hind limb the hind limb and the and the um forelimb. Did everyone sign in? Uh, who has a sign-in sheet? So I'm just gonna ask you guys a couple questions. Just a couple questions, and uh, you guys feel free to just uh, discuss it with someone next to you. Okay. So the first question would be: four factors. This will be my next. But be my next powerful. This is not as powerful. As you're this i7, right? Yeah. yeah. To get this i7, you know, it's a lot. But how much? This like the problem is to get it to an i7, you have to get a special. You ever heard of DPU or something? There's some kind of graphics. Uh, the i7 version has like a, a graphics card uh -huh. that ups the price. So that's why the best deal is the lowest model. Yeah. But you have to get set up for an i an i7, so you can't. It's a trade-off because mm -hmm. the i7 has that graph. I'll tell you after. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, they're probably. Yeah. You guys already got this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one was simple. Yeah. So what was it? That was just GPX five and four respectively. Okay. So which one was it for the four limb? Five and four. For the four limb. Five and four. Five and four respectively. Oh, okay. Okay. I see. I see. All right. All right, so uh, did you guys get this? It's in the middle of the sandwich. Yeah, it's in the middle of the sandwich. That's right, but what? what? The lateral what? The lateral. <laughs> okay, so lateral what? Not the lateral means the darn plate. No, you, you, you're switching the order. Lateral plate means the darn. Lateral plate means the darn. It matters. It matters. I'm sorry. It matters. So I think my home, that's right. That's right. So this is lateral play means it is. And what were the two parts of the lateral play means it is? That's right. Somatic is splanchnic. What does splanchnic give rise to? What does splanchnic lateral play mean? Yeah. Not the not the gut. Not the gut. It just surrounds oh. it surrounds the gut tube. It actually gives rise to um it actually it actually gives rise to some of like the muscles of like the um like the intestinal wall. Um but yeah, so um yeah, so lateral plate mesoderm it it's divided to the somatic and then to the, the splanchnic. Okay, so let's see here. So what
Okay, so Okay, so um, what are the three parts of somewhere? Well, who who wants to answer this? So what are the three parts of somewhere? Okay, hey babe, you want to ask everything, man. <laughs> oh, go ahead, babe. I'll give it to you. Go ahead. Babe. So the first part is sweater tone, buyer tone, and the tone. That's right. So what the, what's the sweater tone for me? Sweater tone forms our silk skeleton, which is composed of the vertebrae and the ribs. The buyer tone forms the muscles. That's it right. Ultimately forms the muscles. And the dermatonum forms the dermis and the superficial fascia. That's right. That's right. Perfect. You nailed it. Okay, so we got we got Y, X, and then Z. So what is Y? Okay, embryo blast. Okay, so mm -mm. so so remember, remember the epiblast and hypoblast come from the inner cell mass. Okay, so what what would what would Y be? Okay, so this is the inner cell mass. What's the what's the other name for this? Embryo blast. It will be it will become the embryo, but it, it will further differentiate into the epiblast and hypoblast, and then it's the epiblast that we're concerned with. Yeah. And so, what would what would Z be? And the trophoblast is going to become what? The placenta. What's that term? What is called the So. Do you guys remember what uh, the trophoblast, um, so it splits, it, it splits off to two different things. I remember cyto okay, I'm like cyto trophoblast let me see syncytio okay syncytio okay I'm, I, 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 my spelling is so off so I mean just um I don't have spell. I don't have spell check on here, so. You're close. It's just the Y after the C. Uh -uh. I, I, there's no spell check. <laughs> there's no spell check, huh? <laughs> don't worry about it. You guys get the point. It's fine. Yeah. You get the point. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. All right. Um. And how about X? Yeah, that would be yeah. It would it would become the future yolk sac. Okay, future yolk sac. Right. Mm -hmm. So this will become the future yolk sac. Okay, so quick question here. Yeah, sir, you have a question here. Yeah, go ahead. So the blastocyst is where you have the um. Yeah, this should be the, this should be the blastocyst, right? No, this should be the blastocyst. The whole thing is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so.
The next question for you guys is where would um so how are we going to form the amniotic cavity? How are we gonna form the amniotic cavity? I'm gonna get someone else's take. Um, yeah. Oh, from the intercellular mass. He's going on someone else's pants. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, all right. Okay, so what what was it? what was, uh, from like the intercell mass? Actually, let me let me check it. Let me check it. I'm not actually forgetting. Let me see. Uh, yes. Yes, you're right. Yeah. So yep, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. That sounds right to me. Yeah, right. Sounds right to me. Okay, so right? it's it's only the epiblast. Mm -hmm. Only the epiblast becomes the embryo. Yeah. All right. Remember the 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 cells of that epiblast is going to oh. migrate in, and that's how you form the primitive streak. Yeah. Right. And then the primitive streak is going to give rise to the mesoderm and endoderm. Right. So, but that's all happening. That's in that, that, that little bottom layer yeah. of the epiblast. That's what, yeah. that's what you're talking about. Yeah. That yeah. Little, yeah. 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 From that Perfect. Did an awesome job. Awesome job. Thank you, bro. <laughs> right. Okay, cool. You guys, uh, you guys, you guys seem like you guys are pros. You guys seem like you guys are pros. So we'll probably <laughs> we'll leave it here. Okay, so I I'm gonna post a video. So if you guys like maybe want to like go through it or something, but um, I'm still gonna post the notes as well. So. Um,